I'm good. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's briefing on a new report quantifying the investment requirements for America's multimodal uh, transportation system. AASHTO, APTA, and the Transportation Research Board have worked together to produce such reports in prior authorization cycles and are proud to do so again. I am Art Gazzetti, the Vice President for Policy of the American Public Transportation Association, APTA. Today you will hear from the single two people closest to America's highway and public transportation needs, Bud Wright and Michael Milanofi. Uh, Bud Wright is Executive Director of the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, the organization we know as AASHTO. Uh, celebrating its 100th year, AASHTO is the longstanding national association for all of the state DOTs. Uh, Bud's background includes service as Executive Director of the Federal Highway Administration and other safety and finance uh, positions in FHWA. Uh, he became AASHTO's Executive Director in January uh, 2013. Uh, Michael Milanofi, my boss, uh, became President and CEO of APTA in 2011. He brought with him a strong public transportation background in both the operating side and the supplier side of the business. Uh, Michael ran the transit systems in Charlotte, North Carolina, Wichita, Kansas, Hamilton, Ohio, Laredo, uh, Texas. Immediately prior to coming to APTA, Michael served 10 years as Vice President for the bus manufacturer MCI, Motor Coach Industries, where he was responsible for operations in the United States and Canada. Uh, now, uh, but I note that AASHTO celebrating its 100th year, APTA's roots go back to 1882. So we predate the internal combustion engine uh, itself at APTA. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the great work and partnership of Carol Werner and her outstanding team at the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Uh, we thank them for their always exceptional uh, efforts with these briefings. Uh, Bud and Michael will each make presentations uh, and we will, they will take uh, questions and answers uh, following that. And uh, Bud, you are up first. Art, thank you very much. And um, we'll take being the young up and comer on the block at 100 <laughs> years old, so uh, we're proud of that. Thanks everybody for coming out today. Uh, I know it's not a great weather day outside, but I guess we can be thankful that the weather is liquid rather than frozen today and enjoy that. Uh, Michael and I have some important information to share with you this afternoon about the ongoing underinvestment in roads, bridges, and transit infrastructure in this country. The new bottom line report prepared for AASHTO and the American Public Transportation Association makes a strong case that just shoring up the Highway Trust Fund to maintain current levels will not make much of a dent in the needed transportation investment that will improve economic performance and Americans' quality of life. It shows that a flat level federal program will not keep pace with rising levels of vehicle miles traveled on highways or with the growing demands for public transportation services, much less close the investment gap that already exists. So what is the bottom line report? AASHTO and APTA wanted to develop a resource that would be the most comprehensive analysis of the nation's surface transportation investment needs. The bottom line report, previously published in 2002 and 2009, is based on the forecasting models and data systems used by the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration, and on results of Federal Highway Administration analyses supplemented by additional research. What are the key findings of the bottom line report? Currently, governments at all levels are investing about $105 billion annually in capital improvements for the U.S. highway and transit networks. But they need to spend $59 billion more each year to improve the transportation system and keep up with rising demand. Just for highways and bridges, we need $740 billion over the next six years, roughly $120 billion a year, but the investment currently by all levels of government is about $88 billion. That's a more than $30 billion gap that grows each year. For transit, we need to be spending $43 billion annually to improve system performance, but annual cap uh, capital uh, spending is much less, just $17.1 billion a year. So what are the ramifications of all that? Obviously, this report points out the massive challenge that faces the United States Congress 
and every unit of government in the United States. When we think of the federal contribution to, federal, to capital projects, we often overlook the separate operating costs that state DOTs and local agencies face, from patching potholes and running snow plows to paying worker salaries. Total operating and capital spending by governments on highways is about $156 billion a year. The federal share is only about one-fourth of that amount, leaving the remainder to states, cities, counties, and increasingly the private sector to pick up the rest. And states are stepping up and investing more. Just in the last month, Iowa and North Dakota substantially increased their transportation investment. Meanwhile, states as diverse as Wisconsin, Texas, Washington, and Utah are all working on serious proposals to address perceived shortfalls in state-level investments. But state and local governments cannot do it alone. There has to be a federal program. There has to be a national vision guiding the transportation investment that occurs in this country. And that's why it's so important for the Congress to act and to act now. I hope that everybody in this room knows that the current federal uh, surface transportation authorization legislation expires on May 31st, less than three months from now. And yet we don't have a plan on the table for how to deal with that, how to find the revenues necessary to make the investment that's necessary at the federal government level. Let's take a short moment and watch a video uh, that I think really makes the case for why we need to make the hard choices now. This is something that we put together in conjunction with an infographic that station investment. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> America has always been defined by big thinking and the will to accomplish great things. That same spirit has long fueled our transportation system. From the turn of the 20th century, when we began to connect our farms to our towns, to the 1950s, when we created a national system of highways and a way to pay for them through the Highway Trust Fund, to today, when our integrated network of roads, rail, ports, air, and public transit helps get us where we need to go. As our transportation system expanded, so has our economic prosperity. New industries emerged, new trade corridors surfaced, we had greater freedom to choose the jobs we wanted and the places where we wanted to live. Without the ambitious vision of our leaders, both national and local, the American dream would look much different today. But if you think that dream will go on uninterrupted, think again. While our nation continues to grow, our transportation system hasn't. Since the 1950s, the number of motor vehicles has quadrupled, challenging our ability to maintain our infrastructure and preserve our investments. And our overworked transit system struggles to meet the demands of nearly 11 billion annual passengers. Business owners have to rely on a freight network in danger of not delivering. Commuters spend hundreds of extra hours sitting in their cars, either because of congested roadways or because they don't have viable public transportation options. Family vacations are detoured by unsafe bridges, or workers are stuck choosing jobs based on distance rather than opportunity. But what if our system could keep up with a level of funding in line with the realities of 2015 and beyond? Skilled workers wouldn't have to move away to find better jobs. We could get better access to our abundant natural resources and agricultural products. We could again climb the ranks of global competitiveness. Every dollar invested in highways or transit returns two to three times that amount to the economy. In other words, if we continue to improve our transportation system, the average American household could benefit from more than $5,000 in extra annual income. It's time to get back to thinking big, to once again ensure the strength of our solutions meets the size of our challenges. In 2015, let's restore our trust in the Highway Trust Fund, and let's redefine how we move our nation forward. As I said earlier, um, this is going to require hard choices and difficult action by the Congress, but I think it boils down to something fairly simple. We have a choice between making the country stronger or making the country weaker, and without this transportation investment taking place, we will make the country weaker. 
With that, let me uh, turn things over to Michael Milanofi. Michael. Thank you very much, but thank you to all of you for coming here this afternoon. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you to our friends at ESI for hosting us today. You are generous as always. I'm Michael Milanofi, President and CEO of the American Public Transportation Association, also known as APTA. We're pleased today to be here with our, my good friend Bud Wright and our friends here at AASHTO, and I think that it says so much to see us sitting here side by side, public transportation, and the highway and bridge people to be together to talk about transportation as a system. It's so critical that we look at all of this as a system working together. There are no monolithic pieces of bus and rail and highways and roads. It's all about us working together as a system. And it's our duty as transportation professionals to share this message with everyone else. I want to uh, take a moment to acknowledge the authors of the report. They're with us here today. Uh, Alan Pisarki and uh, Arlie Reno, thank you very much for your very hard work on that. Please give them a hand for doing an excellent report. And like all good pieces of work, it's a collaboration, and they collaborated at, uh, with the National Research, was sponsored jointly by the National Cooperative Highway Research Program and the Transit Cooperative Research Program. And I think that uh, Diane Schwager is here with us as well. Thank you for being here, and thank you for all your work in helping us to facilitate this good research work. As Bud touched on, the bottom line report estimates $163 billion is needed annually over the next six years to fix the nation's aging service transportation system. This includes an annual capital investment of nearly $43 billion for public transportation. And as Bud touched on, only $17 billion of that is being funded right now on an annualized basis. This is creating a tremendous investment gap. At a time when, just this week, we announced the highest ridership numbers in 58 years. 10.8 billion trips were taken on public transportation last year. The last time it was that high was 1956 when gasoline was 23 cents a gallon. It's time for us to really look at investment in infrastructure. Let's look at this first chart here. This chart display show, on display here shows the current annual capital funding that's not sufficient to cover the ongoing asset replacement need. The FTA recently determined that the state of good repair backlog alone is $88 billion. That's not ongoing operations, that's not expansion, that's just state of good repair ongoing backlog. So the study looked at a variety of different growth scenarios and it chose the mid-level assumption as the basement basis for the investment requirements. Our infrastructure is a product of an intergovernmental partnership with federal, state, local, and passenger fares all combining together to fund our nation's public transportation systems. It truly takes a collaboration of many parties to make this happen. May 31, May tw or MAP 21 is going to expire and obviously we need to renew that. We need to have a consistent stream of funding to go forward. We must have something that we can depend on, that we can make long-range plans on so that we can build our nation's highways bridges and public transportation in a smart, efficient, effective, dependable way. Lurching month to month, quarter by quarter with short-term extensions isn't going to create the strongest and best transportation system in the world. We have to do this together in a collaborative, long-term way. It provides access for jobs, for mobility in our communities, for transportation and travel choices. We have to have all of these together. So let's look at some 20-year trends. We talked about the highest ridership in 20 years, or in 58 years. So look at some growth rates. Since 1995, the population of this country has grown 21%. 1995 to now, 21% growth rate in population. VMT, vehicle miles traveled, the metric we often use for how much people are driving, has grown about 25%. So fairly parallel past population growth and VMT growth. In that same period of time, if you see the blue line in the top there, that's public transit growth. We're up 39% in that same time period. So 21% population growth, 39% public transit growth. The high number we saw last year wasn't just an anomaly. It wasn't a result of spiking gas prices. In fact, in the fourth quarter of last year, gas prices dropped 43 cents a gallon. Yet we saw a 1% increase in ridership across the country. We are seeing a change in how people move about our country and how they access public transportation, how they're growing and building our communities. We've done a couple of studies here recently that uh, help support the data we're seeing here. The first is an economic study. We did is we looked at how do we quantify 
the benefits of putting in new infrastructure. Why do we build new infrastructure? We don't build it just to create hard hat and yellow vest jobs. We do it to make something better. And so in an economic study, we looked at typically we create uh, our hard hat jobs are about 21,000 21, jobs for every $1 billion in investment. When you look at the better, when you measure the better, we come up with over 50,000 jobs that are created or sustained as a result of each billion dollar investment in our nation's public transportation infrastructure. Bringing these numbers together creates real jobs. It creates not just the jobs that build the things, but create the jobs that make our economy stronger, make our country stronger, and as Bud so eloquently pointed out, creates better global competitiveness for our nation. And there's several trends that we're seeing that are driving some of these things. Certainly, one of the metrics that's also important is that one dollar in public transportation, your slideshow between two and three in the public transit space, we see it as high as four times return on investment with those dollars. And two things are driving that as we look at the uh, both ends of the geological spectrum. The millennials are coming in to the marketplace in a big way. We did a recent study looking at the travel patterns of millennials, and we found that 70 percent of them prefer to live in a community that gives them transportation choices. When we grew up as kids, we had a binary choice, didn't we, buddy? You could either take a car or you took transit. It was one of the two. That's what you did. And we looked now, and there's a wide variety. You could take a bus, a train, a shared use car, a shared use bike, all these different things within a week. We're changing how we move about our communities. And because of this change, we're seeing how we also use our systems differently. Instead of having fold out schedules that were hard to read, especially on rainy days like today, information's on our smartphones. And we're equipping our buses and trains with 3G, 4G, smart technology. We know where the vehicles are going to be. We can even pay for our fares with our phones in many cities now. And it's giving us greater access to our communities and changing how we live and how we build our urban environment. And with that, we need a seamless transportation that supports it. And it's not just about the infrastructure for the roads, bridges, highways, and transit. It's not just for the businesses. It's how we build our residential infrastructure as well and how that's impacted by our transportation choices. We did a study with the National Association of Realtors, and we found in the time from 2008 to 2013, during the toughest economic recession of our lifetime, we studied a number of cities across the country, new and old, from Phoenix to Boston, oldest transit system in the country, one of the newest. We looked at housing, residential housing stock along high frequency rail transit corridors, and we found that that housing stock was 42% more resilient. What does that mean? It means as prices dropped out from under the economy and around housing, those prices dropped less. And as the economy came back, they came back quicker. What we found was that residential housing stock along high frequency transit corridors was as valuable as oceanfront property. And if you had rail oceanfront property, you were in California and you were loving it. You could do everything. It was great. So why do we have these other reports, these numbers? Because it all supports these different messages. It isn't just this report here, the bottom line report saying alone that these numbers are real, these things are happening. As we look from multiple angles at all these pieces, they support that these numbers are very real. These needs for our country are very real. So what does it take? What happens when we build our infrastructure? Public transit is a $61 billion a year industry, 400,000 people employed in our industry. And here's a really neat stat. When we talk about the efficiency of government funding, people say, oh, should we devolve this to the state? Should we do it where we could do it more efficiently and effectively? But what really are the investments of the federal government and our other government partners? They're really for capital funding. The federal government doesn't build our rolling stock. They don't build our buses, trains, and our shelters, and our transit centers. The private sector does. So when we analyze these government dollars coming into our business, fully 73 percent of the government dollars that are flowing into the public transit space are going right through to the private sector. They're creating jobs all across the country. When we build rail cars for New York, for Miami, for Los Angeles, we're creating jobs all across the nation in places like Lincoln, Nebraska, buses in, Anna, in Anniston, Alabama, or Pemina, North Dakota, or trains in Boise, Idaho. We're creating good paying, high technical jobs all across the country. An investment in public transportation in the nation's total transportation system creates jobs and a vibrant economy all across this country. It stretches border to border. As we look at the changing way we fund and finance our programs, it's not just about government funding, it's also about financing programs. We're seeing a 
of course, talk of RIF loans and TIFIA loans, but also public-private partnerships. But those that play in the PPP space, as we found at a recent meeting we had at the Treasury Department, which was supported by Secretary Fox, Secretary Pritzker, and Secretary Liu, we talked about how those that invest in the private sector play on a global scale. They look where are the best places around the world to invest their private sector dollars to build infrastructure. And I like infrastructure. You can have good revenue streams or hard assets. There's a good government purpose to them. When we look at our country's patchwork of 50 different states of PPP rules that some allow, some prohibit, some do, some don't, and uncertain federal infrastructure investment, it raises the risk quotient for PPP investment. It makes us a more risky investment. There's an aversion to investing those PPP dollars in our country when you look at us in comparison to places like our neighbor to the north in Canada or our friends in Australia that have more reliable, dependable funding and more standardized local funding models at the state or provincial levels. If we want to play in this world, if we want to bring in this innovative financing, we have to look at policy as well as long-term funding to bring the packaging together. So some might suggest that by getting all players and government to work together and passing a long-term bill, it's too high of a mountain to climb. However, we look back at the history of the presidential administrations and our Congresses that have enacted bills, it's important to take some lessons from that. In 1983, President Ronald Reagan, with a majority Democratic House and a majority Republican Senate, worked together to raise the federal gas tax from four cents to nine cents. He called that program a nickel for America, Four cents for roads, bridges, and highways. One cent for transit. That's the origin of the 80-20 split. We've supported it ever since. This discussion that there's been a diversion of highway funds into transit, simply not true. We've been there, just as we are today, in a partnership, looking at it as a holistic system. Dedicated funds for road, bridges, and highways. Dedicated funds for transit coming out of this user fee-based system. And is it just that happened back in 83 with Reagan? Look at 91 with President George H.W. Bush during a Democratic majority in both the House and the Senate. They worked together to increase the federal gas tax from 9 to 14.1 cents. As we look to President Clinton in Congress, the last gas tax increase more than 20 years ago in 1993. Democratic president, Democratic majority in both houses, tax was raised from 14.1 to the current 18 0.4 cents. So I believe, no, I predict that the current, in the current economic model, we can get this done. We must get this done. Our nation is counting on us to invest in what is truly a nonpartisan, bipartisan, bicameral investment in our country. Our nation's infrastructure needs this. America needs this. We need to invest in our infrastructure. And this report clearly quantifies the data we need to support this important investment in our country. Thank you very much, and we stand ready for questions. Sorry, this is Kelly Major at CQ Roll Call. Are there any specific programs in Map 21 that you're keeping an eye on in the upcoming new highway bill that you're concerned might disappear under new legislation? Um, I would say no. I don't. I don't necessarily see any programs disappearing. But one of the things that um, Ashton certainly has adopted as a as a policy. Uh, approach for our states is that um, we like the notion of having a performance-based program, one in which um, states are expected to achieve certain outcomes and then they're given the flexibility to achieve those outcomes. So certainly one of the things that we have been emphasizing in our uh, discussions with uh, members of Congress and their staffs is that that flexibility is important. Creating additional new programs, new categories, new slices of funding make it more difficult to achieve those kinds of performance-based outcomes. Um, so while I don't see uh, any of the, I'll call them broad eligibilities disappearing, you know, certainly there may be some tinkering with the program descriptions and such uh, as we go forward in MAP 21 reauthorization. As we've looked at, it's a great question, as we've looked at 
local transit tax initiatives across the country, and we've been tracking them since 2000. Than 70 percent passage rate, which we had 69 percent passage rate or 71 percent passage rate last year, with 49 of 61 local initiatives passed. And when we look at why are these local initiatives passing, and there's a harder hill to climb at the federal level, it has to do with accountability. And so, as Bud touched on, with Map 21, there's still obviously many, many rules that have to be promulgated that have yet to come out of the 27-month bill. And among those are performance-based metrics, and having those allows us to have more accountability, more transparency in the federal program. So we're not just saying we're going to do good, we're going to do better. We actually measure those things and demonstrate that, and we think that's a key piece. And obviously, another thing we're looking for that's coming out of MAP 21 is the FTA, for the very first time, is becoming a regulatory agency and having a, a wide and broad uh, a mandate on safety and security in this nation's public transportation systems. And so we look forward to those things coming out. And I think as we've talked with Congress, we see this next bill being less about major policy changes. A lot of those policy changes were truly captured in MAP 21, although it was 27 months of bill, as we know, it was about 60 months worth of policy. So we look forward to those things coming out and then matching that with the proper funding so that we can have a good long-term implementation of a very good, robust, and flexible program for our country going forward. You want to see those performance metrics kept from MAP 21 into the new legislation? Well, those, that was one of the things that was a key component of that. And it was, uh, it was looking at your assets and grading your assets, looking at that true state of good repair. It's one thing for us to say we have a state of good repair need. It's another to be able to measure that and have national standards for that. National standards are very important. And investment in our research, our technology, and our standards programs are critical. And why? So they can come back to this, so we can have accountability, so we can be accountable to the citizens of this country, and having that data is important. So that, those are some of the many things that we're still waiting to be fully rolled out and waiting for the uh, ANPRMs and NPRMs and the rules, and we ex expect that will be helpful for us moving forward and look forward to that. Great question. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you for your uh, time and for the presentation. Very compelling. Um, uh, on the funding side of things, uh, VMT per capita in this country has been on its way down since 2004. Total VMT since the beginning of the Great Recession. It's a definite trend, and you mentioned what's going on with millennials. We also have CAFE standards increasing dramatically over the next several years. So long story short, consumption of gasoline is on a downward trajectory. From a revenue side, are there any policy recommendations that you are making beyond raising the, gas, the retail gas tax, if that even is a policy recommendation? Um, and if so, from the advocate's perspective, how do we participate in those discussions when we're back in district? Now, um, well, first of all, uh, on the VMT issue, uh, there isn't any question that in this recent period of time that there has been some reduction in VMT per capita, but I think one of the things that has been widely reported, which isn't true, is that um, VMT as a whole is declining. VMT is actually rising in the country. Um, we project, in fact, in this bottom line report that uh, a growth rate that is 1% uh, or greater is likely for the future. But all of the factors that you describe with regard to the reliability of the federal gasoline tax or gas taxes at state and local level are definitely true. And one of the reasons why, uh, you know, there is a lot of discussion about looking at different approaches for funding transportation in the future, whether they be mileage-based user fees or other approaches. But we're not ready for that now. I mean, the technology is there. We're certainly um, doing some experimentation, and there are pilots in various states looking at mileage-based user fees. Right now, I think many would say that the gasoline tax, if it were to be continued or increased, has the capacity to carry us forward, certainly through a next reauthorization period, if not beyond. Uh, for the longer term, uh, I would absolutely agree with you that we'll have to look at other solutions. Now, all of that said, um, back in December, I would have suggested that there may be some momentum gathering that uh, gasoline tax or user-based approach is the most likely outcome with regard to how the Congress might choose to fund transportation investment. But much of that enthusiasm seems to have died out as we turn the page with the new uh, Congress and uh, into 2015. And the approaches that the Congress uh, seem to be more uh, considering now are ones that are 
not directly related to transportation, but are ways in which to create additional revenues through the general fund to support transportation investment. Um, I will say that we have been um, relatively agnostic on that uh, issue. Uh, what we are looking for is something that is long-term and sustainable. Uh, and, you know, we're not going to, frankly, be picky about what solution the Congress comes up with, but uh, making sure that a solution is derived that can give us some certainty, that can enable uh, states and local governments and transit entities to be able to plan their projects as long as possible into the future, I think, is one of the key elements that we're all looking for. I think, actually, we had a chart in uh, my presentation that uh, substantiated exactly what uh, but had talked about there continues to be we showed a 25 percent increase in uh, VMT over that uh, 95 to uh, 2015 time frame. I think it was it's, it's tracking right on there. Uh, we of course support any and all revenue streams, and we're grateful to take all the dollars are green. This you know, our our primary job here is to substantiate the need. No question, we have to do that. Now certainly, APT is on record supporting gas tax increase because it's a user based fee. And uh, the more that we can show a user-based fee and a correlation of how we operate and fund our programs, I think the easier it is for the public to understand that. We look at what we have a gap. The, the trust fund runs out May 31. We have a tremendous gap we've got to fill there. And what are options that can fill that quickly? What are options that can uh, not have to borrow uh, against the general fund? What are options that can be created without creating new bureaucracy that are small government? Certainly use an increase in the user-based fee makes some sense and matches both the uh, you know, values of, of both sides of the, of the House and the Senate. By having a small government-based program that's very efficient, it's only collected at 1,000 refineries around the country, it's an option. But there are many, many options out there, and certainly APTA takes a very agnostic position as well. We're willing to work with all different options and to see what can best fund the program. The, re the, bit, the key here is we need a long-term, well-funded bill. Now, if we could continue past six years, fantastic, but at a minimum, we need good, well-funded six-year bill. Hi, I'm Tony DeSantis with the Delaware Valley Association of Rail Passengers in Philadelphia. Uh, you had mentioned that an increase in the gasoline tax could carry us through the next authorization. I'm wondering how much of a gasoline tax do you want and how much of a gasoline tax realistically can we expect from this Congress? Well, um, I won't uh, answer the question of how much we want because uh, we haven't really attached ourselves to a particular funding level uh, as the outcome that would be the most promising. But I can tell you approximately what it would take in order to maintain the current levels of funding plus inflation, and that would be an increase somewhere in the magnitude of 12 to 14 cents per gallon. Uh, that would carry us, that would create the uh, level of revenues necessary to bridge the current funding gap. Some of you in the room may not be aware that um, just maintaining the current uh, level of the federal fees that flow into the Highway Trust Fund uh, would require a substantial reduction in the current investment level at the federal level, which is why we are in the position that we are in. Uh, just to do what we're doing now is going to require substantial infusion of revenues into the Highway Trust Fund. That's what it would take to maintain uh, current investment levels, yes. And we take a similar position. That we know what it takes to maintain minimum, but we just talked about tremendous backlog. Good enough is not good enough. Keeping the state, current state is, is moving our country backwards. And as we look at, if we truly want to get away from uh, transfers from the general fund, and we want to get into user-based fee, it's going to take a, a substantial increase there to do that. But if you're, if you're going to do it, take the challenge and do it once and do it right. Don't keep coming back and piecemeal a little bits here and there. Do, do it as a good uh, one-time move. It's been more than 20 years since we've done it. It's time. I'm going to uh, throw out a question relative to the bottom line report. And while well, we look for a few more until, until we conclude. Uh, the bottom line uh, report connects transportation investments to economic performance. That's what the report does. Uh, Michael and Bud both talked about return on investments, and I'm wondering if you can make a case that a transportation bill could pay for itself in the sense that you underpin the economy necessarily through the transportation investments 
that sparks economic activity, which generates additional revenues that you know, end up adding revenues to the uh, overall picture. Can it support itself? Can it pay for itself? Well, I mean, uh, that's probably a question that somebody at CBO uh, would be most appropriate to answer because that gets into the notion of dynamic scoring and it's not something that is currently uh, permissible within the rules under which CBO or for that matter, uh, OMB operates. Uh, I mean, certainly we know that uh, just based on some of the information that was reported in the bottom line that uh, increasing the investment in transportation is going to stimulate economic activity in this country. But as with many other initiatives taken at the federal level, that ability to connect back that economic uh, growth and economic activity to uh, the investment levels that are actually required for the underlying legislation is not something that currently can be done. Often we're asked, why don't we operate our systems like they do in, in Asia and some European countries where the railroad is just part of what they do, that they own the retail around there, they have the office buildings, the retail, the residential, the, and, and those fund the railroad. And that, the, the concept is called value capture. And that's where they truly, you can pay for themselves. But our current, the way that our current legislation and our current regulatory environment exists, it's not very conducive to us doing that. If you were to go over to Japan or Hong Kong and you look at their transit systems, they own the mall that's over the transit center, and they own the Marriott, and they own the, the business buildings along there, and that's how you can pay for themselves for that value capture. As we look at future models that make sense, as we look at our corridors where we build this infrastructure, if there's ways for that revenue to help fund the ongoing operation and maintenance of those that benefit from the, in, the placement of that infrastructure. As we put in those fixed guideway corridors, those that benefit, if they could help fund the ongoing operation and maintenance, that would be a great paradigm for us to look at in the future. I, I just have a comment. Um, that's kind of the way that the New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad and all the rest of those railroads also built their empires because they not only built the tracks, but they also owned the land. So. That is a good point. I was thinking more that the governmental investment would come back in the way of sparking economic activity and, uh, and bringing additional funds to the, to the Treasury. But all, all those points were certainly good. Uh, additional questions? Uh, yeah, Can there's I a few more. One yeah, more please. question. There we go. Yes. I was wondering if one. you could speak a little bit more about devolution. Specifically, you're talking about a favorable environment for local tax, and tax initiatives. We see, you know, areas that are miles ahead in terms of pavement condition. Orange County comes to the example because that's where I'm actually from previously. Um, why not put the energy into, you know, into devolution as is a hot topic here on the Hill? Well, first, as I'm sure you could point out, the freeze-thaw cycles on the roadway network in Orange County isn't particularly rough down in, if you're talking Orange County, <laughs> California, or Florida for that matter. Uh, Look, this is a national program with national significance and national implications. It takes a partnership. The local governments play a role. The passengers pay a role. They pay their fare every time they get on, the, on their bus or train. States, in most cases, play a role, and the federal government plays a role. This is a national system. Let us not be fooled by this notion that, oh, we could take the 2.86 cents or even the 18 cents of the gas tax and just raise the state gas taxes 18 cents. It doesn't work that way. One, we've got a major infusion of money from the general fund right now. Second, all different states have different levels. You could see 30, 40, 50 cent gas increase, gas tax increases in individual states. That's untenable. This is a national program of national significance. There is a reason it was set up this way and it is to create a national partnership. Devolution does not make our country stronger. That's not how we build a great national economy. Yeah, let me just say uh, very simply, devolution won't work, doesn't work. Um, that federal foundation is critical, and uh, Michael is absolutely right that the amount necessary to increase the uh, tax rate or whatever other revenue source the state might use uh, 
would be so significant in some states as to be impossible to achieve. And when that becomes the case, then the nature of a national program, one that has an interconnected system, disappears. Uh, and that's why we have a federal program. I mean, there are many members in the Congress who point back to the Constitution as the foundation for why we invest in transportation. That's very legitimate. It started with the ability to move commerce across uh, state borders. Uh, and that really continues to be the foundation, that interconnected network. And with devolution, um, you lose the possibility of achieving that over the long term. Just, I just want to add one other point on that. It used to be that we had a very strong federal piece there, and, and the challenge had been, would the locals step up to bring up their match? And what we've seen now is the locals, the communities have found they appreciate the investment in infrastructure. They get it. They understand it. They trust their local operators to do good things, whether they're building roads, highways, transit. They get it. They said, we want to invest in our communities to make them better. We want to have a competitive community, and so we'll tax ourselves to do that. But in partnership, we've stepped up at a local level. You, federal government, also step up and do as a partnership. So I think it's less about a devolution to the local level and more about the states and localities have, have made a stronger partner. They're looking for the federal government to continue to be their strong partner there as well. Uh, Eugene Malero with Transport Topics. Uh, another funding proposal, if you can um, maybe weigh in, uh, congressional leaders um, are telling people that uh, highway funding and transportation funding should be made part of an overall tax reform package. Uh, could you, you know, just share your thoughts about that? And also, uh, can you speak a little bit about the administration's, you know, what we briefly have so far under New Grow America Act and their funding proposal there? Well, I mean, I, I will start by saying I'm not a tax policy expert. I'm more of a transportation expert, and that's probably stretching things a little bit to even claim that. But, uh, I mean, certainly there are non-user-based options on the table. Um, you know, I think it's a matter of political speculation as to what the right environment is going to be for uh, any one of those approaches to move forward. Uh, you know, we've certainly made the case to members of Congress that not acting uh, before March 30, I mean before May 31st uh, is going to result in significant disruption uh, to the flow of projects around this country. Uh, but how they get there, what the political compromises that are necessary to come up with that funding package might have to be, uh, I wish I were able to tell you what the answer to that uh, is because uh, there are plenty of people who probably are at the controls who haven't yet figured out exactly how all that's going to come together. I'm with about 100 percent on, on that piece and with respect to the Grow America Act or Grow America II as the revised version, whatever they're going to call that, going from four years to six, six years. Look, there's little pieces we may or may not agree with here and there, but overall it's, it, we're very pleased to see that the administration clearly is messaging to Congress a strong and major investment in our nation's infrastructure, surface transportation infrastructure is critical. And we must do this. We must make these investments. And I think it's good messaging to Congress and to America that the administration understands and appreciates the need to invest in our infrastructure. Please. Richard Trump. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm David Cameron. I'm Assistant Director, Teamsters Rail Conference. Apt a member. Um, but at a Senate hearing, you had Richard Trumka from the AFL-CIO of Donahue from the Chamber of Commerce yourself. This report, a slew of other reports, desperate needs, bridges collapsing, population growth congestion. The need is so evident, and, and here at this hearing, unanimous from business, from labor, from special interest groups, let's increase funding for transportation. Gas tax, vehicle miles traveled, uh, refinery fee, something, but nothing gets done. So in the face of all of this unanimous support for it, what do we do with a coagulated Congress? I, I truly believe we're going to have a surface transportation bill this year, Dan.